Hello everyone. Welcome to the fourth episode of the YouTube live series on inclusion and diversity in geotech, which is also the last Geo Institute live stream of 2020. I'm your host, Manzar Pehlivan, and I'm a geotechnical engineer specialized in geotechnical earthquake engineering, like my guest today. I work with Jacobs in Seattle, Washington, where I'm the Northwest Tunnel and Ground Engineering Group Leader and the Executive Advisor to the Global Growth Strategy and Solutions Director. If you have listened or watched some of the previous episodes that we've had, you already know that inclusion and diversity is very dear to my heart. And I'm also the founding, founding chair and the immediate past president of the ASC Geo Institute Outreach and Engagement Committee. And at Jacobs, my company, I am the global co-chair of the One World Employee Network that focuses on cultural inclusion and diversity with a goal of enhancing cultural intelligence of our members and employees and helping them become global citizens. Today, I'm very, very excited and honored to have Dr. Scott Brandenburg as my last guest for 2020 for the Inclusion and Diversity Live Series. Uh, and wrapping up our live stream uh, with him. So Scott is a professor in the Civil and, Envi Civil and Environmental Engineering Department and Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion in the Sumerian Engineering School at the University of California, Los Angeles. His research expertise lies primarily in geotechnical earthquake engineering with focus on multi-hazard multi -hazard reliability of levee systems, the response of the foundations to liquefaction induced lateral spreading, seismic earth pressures acting on earth retention systems, and cyber infrastructure projects, including development of community databases for liquefaction assessment. Scott has authored over 100 technical papers and received the 2015 Walter L. Huber Award, 2013 Sh uh, Prakash Research Award, 2010 Casa Grande Professional Development Award. He earned his PhD and master's in 2005 and 2002 respectively from the University of California, Davis, and his bachelor's in 2000 from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Over the years, I have, I've have had the pleasure of working with Scott on several instances and most prominently for the uh, at the Geotechnical Earthquake Engineering and Soil Dynamics Technical Committee of the Geo Institute, which uh, Scott is the chair of. Uh, before I turn it over to you, Scott, I want to take this opportunity to really thank you for your ongoing friendship and mentorship, which I've cherished very much over the years. So. Welcome, Scott, and thank you again for agreeing to be my guest for the last live stream of 2020. But before I give it to you and um, start asking you questions, I've heard that it was your birthday recently. <laughs> so, and I'll take this opportunity also to sing happy birthday to you now. All right. Thanks a lot, Manzer. I'm happy to be here. It was my birthday on Saturday. I'm to the age where we prefer not to celebrate birthdays anymore, but uh, it is a fact of life that happens every year. So thanks a lot. I'm happy to be here to uh, talk to you and thanks for inviting me. Yeah, I was just kidding. I was not going to sing the happy birthday anyhow. So like I'm not going to put you or any of the audience through that misery. But um, I know like 2020 has been an interesting year for all, for all of us in terms of holiday and birthday celebrations. This is not necessarily related to the inclusion and diversity, but how did you celebrate your birthday, Scott? Well, I guess back in March, I didn't think I would be celebrating while we're still basically on quarantine. So uh, I was just at home with my family, <laughs> like on other days. It was uh, really nice just to have some time to relax. Uh, I also have been sick. I don't, you may hear it in my voice. I have a little scratchy uh, voice, so I may cough a few times. My COVID test was negative, so it's just a cold. I always get a cold this time of year, but um, just so just so people aren't wondering, like, oh no, why is he coughing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to hear that the COVID test was negative, and LA is in lockdown still. Uh, yeah, LA County is having a lot of cases, and so there's been a stay-at-home order issue. It's actually less severe than what we had back in um, in in March and April, but. Um, it hasn't affected me very much because I pretty much just work at home or I guess live at work is another way of putting it these days anyway. So 
um, it, it's had pretty little impact on on my day to day activities. It wouldn't be fair to end the, like the to have the last stream of 2020 and not talk about COVID. So yeah, with that, I will go ahead and start like with my first question, Scott. Um, sure. You know, among many of your other accomplishments in the field of geotechnical earthquake engineering. So I'm pretty sure if anyone is working on that area, they're very familiar with your name. And being a professor at the UCLA uh, Department of Civil Engineering, you've also served, you are serving as Associate Dean of Diversity and Inclusion. Um, for the audience, can you tell us about what sparked your interest in this area and, you know, what is, was the process of like you becoming the Associate Dean of Diversity and Inclusion at UCLA? Yeah, sure. So about four years ago now, um, we had a new dean start in the School of Engineering, Jayathi Murthy, who was in um, at University of Texas prior to that. And diversity was really one of her big priorities when she came in. So um, <clears throat> she started the associate dean position, associate dean for diversity and inclusion in the school. It's something we had never had before. And um, she also started a women in engineering program that goes along with our Center for Excellence in Engineering and Diversity. Um, and then in the summer of 2017, she asked me if I would serve in the role as associate dean. It was a little bit surprising <laughs> to me, um, to be quite honest, that I was asked to do it. Um, I, I hadn't done work you know, directly in that area. It's not my research area, right? I study earthquakes and soil. Um, there are people who study diversity and inclusion as their their field. And so um, I, I guess the reasons why she asked me was that I had had some other leadership positions in the school. I had been chair of our faculty executive committee and our ABED executive committee and had kind of demonstrated an ability to get things done there. And um, Diversity and inclusion had always been something that I was was interested in and wanted to help contribute to. So um, I accepted the position and really started learning, you know, reading up on a lot of the literature. Um, I also felt like we had some great pieces in place at UCLA with our Center for Excellence in Engineering and Diversity. It's one of the oldest such centers in engineering in the, the US. We've it's been there since 1983 and um, starting up the women in engineering program. So, you know, there, I, I knew I would have a great group of people to work with and thought, you know, this is, this is a good way to make a positive contribution. Um, I, I will mention that my term is, is ending January 1st. Um, I'll be handing off to my colleague, Veronica Santos, who's a mechanical engineer. And I'm looking forward to continuing to work as part of the team, you know, at the School of Engineering, but it's good to get fresh perspectives in, especially for diversity positions. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for your continuing championship on that very important topic. But so I guess I'm curious and probably some of our audience is curious too. So can you tell us a little bit about your work as Associate Dean of Diversity and Inclusion at UCLA and like what that really entitles? Sure, no problem. So um, it basically I I do a work that ranges from you know students to staff to to faculty. Um, I'm the direct supervisor to the director of our women in engineering program, Audrey Poole O'Neill, and to the director of our center our seed office, Center for Excellence in Engineering and Diversity, Catherine Douglas. Um, and they in turn each are supervisors to staff in their offices. And um, I meet with them weekly to make sure that the programs we're doing are effective and help develop the programs and, and things like that. So maybe I'll start with, with C, some of the, the work that that office does. Um, so in the summertime, you know, right before students start at UCLA in their freshman year or if they transfer in their you know junior year the first year at ucla we run some fairly intensive instructional programs called bridge um, summer bridge is for freshmen breeze is for transfer students and then we have a program called sice that's for computer science students and it gives students a, a pretty um, immersive experience in college 
So usually they live in the residence halls. This year it had to be remote because of COVID. Um, so they get to know the campus a little bit and like figure out where to go, you know, eat and do laundry and all that kind of stuff. And they take a very compressed course so that they uh, get some instruction in and kind of learn like, wow, this college stuff is for real, you know, this is hard. And so then, then when they hit their first quarter, they're really ready to go. And they're, um, they perform pretty well. Usually students who go through these programs outperform the um, normal, the, the overall cohort of students in terms of their GPA. So that those programs are really effective. Um, SEED also has a course in the fall called Engineering 87. And that's where students get paired with a faculty mentor. Um, and this is their first quarter at UCLA and they get involved in some research. And the reason why that is really effective is that when students enter an engineering program, they're taking chemistry and physics and math and maybe some general education classes, but they're not taking engineering. Um, usually students don't start taking engineering courses until their sophomore year. Maybe it's a little different in computer science. I think students do start programming right away. But a result of that is they often struggle to form a strong engineering identity. And they, they don't get that until maybe their second year. So by having them work with a faculty advisor in their first quarter, it gives them that strong identity. And they get to see how all of the math and chemistry and physics is applied, right? You have to learn those things. It's important, but it's much more pleasant to learn it when you know how you're going to use it. And so that it gives them that. Um, I've supervised about four or five different groups now in these E87 projects. Usually it's groups of five students. And, um, you know, they they do like my I'm, my goal is not for them to do actual like real meaningful research that's going to be publishable or something like that. It's all about the experience for the students. So I want them to come away feeling like they belong in engineering and that they're capable of, of doing this, this hard work. And um, this last year, all five students I supervised four years ago have uh, applied for graduate school and just started grad school this year. So it's, it's, that's a gratifying thing. Uh, and then, you know, SEED also has like corporate relationships. They help students with um, resumes and um, it mock interviews. And then um, there's a mentorship program there, there's just really a lot of programs that go on to help students really feel engaged as, as part of the, the School of Engineering. Um, yeah, and then we also have our Women in Engineering office, and that's new. That started in, in May of 2017, soon after um, Dean Murthy started at UCLA. And um, <clears throat> that program has, even though it's new, has really accomplished a lot already. Um, one of the first things that the director did was started these co-curricular academies and the academies focus on um, women in engineering and well first I should say these programs are open to anybody uh, who you know supports the mission of diversity so it's it's not a program that is restricted only to women and in fact we've done programming for quite a few male students too but um, these academies focus on self-efficacy and professional development and involve industry partners who come in to teach about whatever aspect it is in their industry. So we've done them for aerospace. There's a leadership academy. And uh, it's usually four to six weekend sessions that students participate in. Um, and a lot of them have gone on to get jobs in the industry that they participated in the academy for. Um, more recently, like starting in the summer and fall of 2019, we developed a workshop that we're calling Awareness to Action. Mm -hmm. and it, it directly addresses some of the issues that um, underrepresented engineering students face. So I'll define underrepresented engineering student as being somebody from a racial or ethnic group that's underrepresented. So that would be Black or African American. Um, American Indian, Latino, Latina, or Latinx, I guess it, it, some people call these days. Um, 
Pacific Islander. And then uh, women are also underrepresented in engineering, but right. by various degrees in different departments. Um, our bioengineering department actually is the freshman class is uh, now majority female. And, um, you know, some of the other departments, electrical engineering and aerospace and mechanical are, are lower. So it, it varies. But um, what we do in the workshop is kind of directly start these discussions of what are sometimes fairly uncomfortable topics about why people feel like sometimes outside, you know, they feel like outsiders within engineering because there just aren't very many people who look like them in engineering. And it's easy to sort of form in groups and out groups and people feel excluded in any case. And so we talk about things like implicit bias, um, stereotype threat, and we provide tools for um, intervening and being an ally. And um, so in the fall of 2019, we delivered the workshop to about close to 100 students, maybe just over 100 students. Um, it got mostly positive reviews. Then we were in the process of kind of changing the content and revising it when uh, the COVID lockdown happened. <laughs> and we didn't want to um, do it in the spring online because it, it took a lot of effort to convert it from an in-person activity. You know, students would come in, we'd feed them dinner and have this great time. And then to suddenly transition to online was a challenge, especially when we're talking about these kind of sensitive topics. So we spent this the spring preparing that and and we launched it online um just this last fall again um and then you know last year we focused on issues related to gender we felt like after um the murder of george floyd and the prominence of black lives matter and a lot of the things that have happened this year that we needed to expand it to also deal with race so this last fall we had two different versions one that focused on on gender and one that focused on race. And um, I think students really appreciated having this forum in which to come and discuss, you know, some of the things that they've gone through. I feel like sometimes as engineers, we we're really uncomfortable talking about these things. And we feel like maybe we don't have these problems and it's easy to ignore them. But, you know, they do, they do exist. These are things that are really important to people. And so it's been nice to, um, to work on that. I'm also curious, so like when you, there are a few things that I want to ask about, but like I want to start with this one. So four years ago, when you were just getting into this, you did have the leadership and obviously experience, but not necessarily direct experience with inclusion and diversity. So if you were looking back to these four years, what do you think is the most important thing you get to realize or learn about inclusion and diversity? during that time, if there is something that you can think of? Or like, what, was there any kind of a moment that stood out to you? I don't want to say aha moment, because it's just like so like cliche, but something like that. <laughs> yeah, well, a couple of the big lessons that I've learned is, you know, first, as, as engineers, we often feel like what we do is, is hard science. This is like real stuff, you know, it's physical. If we design foundations wrong, the building settles too much and that's a real thing. And it's easy to kind of look down our noses at other fields like um, social science that studies uh, things like implicit bias and how people engage with each other and human behavior. And we consider that to be a softer science. You know, in reading a lot of the literature, I found that you know, this, these people are really um, operating at a high level, super intelligent. They know exactly what they're doing. And it was great reading through some of those papers because, um, you know, it just gave me an appreciation, I think, for, for some of the work that they do and the insights they have about humans. Um, there have been some other, like, I guess some some moments that there have been great moments and there have been really difficult moments and there have been some tough ones too. Um, you know, it's I guess one of the aspects of the job that I didn't anticipate is just kind of how political it is. Um, 
working in diversity and inclusion means that you sort of automatically inherit a group of people who are going to oppose the work that you're doing. They, they think that it's nonsense. And so, you know, I've gotten um, hate mail and bad things have been said about me in, in articles, and that takes a little bit of getting used to. Um, if you're going to do work in this area, you do develop kind of a thick skin over time, and those things hurt less and less each time they happen, but it takes a while <laughs> for that sort of skin to develop so that you can move forward. Um, of course, usually people who write these things or oppose them, they're opposing an idea of the job that is totally different from what we're actually doing. <laughs> and so um, they're kind of fighting like a straw man version rather than the real thing. And so if I have a chance to explain to people with these views what we're actually doing, usually it ends up, you know, this moment of clarity, which is helpful. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the moments, you know, it's, like any other job, it's it's really like an accumulation of a lot of small moments, right? It's it's a lot of day to day sort of hard work that um, that adds up over time to really be a body of accomplishment. But you know, launching the um, online version of awareness to action this last year was a, a pretty major accomplishment. Um, made us pretty happy uh, being able to do our open houses last April for um, seed and we at UCLA was a big deal that took a lot of time and effort to figure out how to use like the zoom webinar feature, <laughs> bring people in, make sure that we make a good impression so that they still consider coming to UCLA. Um, you know, it's, it's just been a lot of kind of reacting to things this year for sure. But yeah. So I know we previously chatted about this, um, Scott, and you also mentioned earlier uh, when you were explaining what you do as a associate dean, uh, you know, diversity and inclusion and equity, this can be like very, it's difficult to have these candid conversations around it. And although the idea is just like, it's somehow unfortunately becoming kind of a checkbox in some cases it's just like to talk about it but not necessarily having those candid conversations um earlier in the year when we were having a chat you mentioned that um there had been some inclusion and diversity um trainings or the talks that you had given i know we are not with a live audience uh this time but the ones that you were mentioning that it can create like discomfort in the audience and are there any types of questions that you ask in those um, cases what that creates discomfort that discomfort so we are not going to see the uh, live effect from the audience this time but maybe it can help yeah. the ones that are listening to it to like help them think about that what their reactions is because as you mentioned it starts with our unconscious biases and the thing with unconscious biases you just do not know that you have that bias unless you work on recognizing that yeah I, I think one of the mottos that we kind of follow is that you have to become comfortable being uncomfortable right because the most comfortable thing is just to ignore these inequities that exist and move forward just keep doing things the way that we've done them. Uh, but that's not necessarily, I mean, that's obviously not the right way to go from a social and sort of a, an ethical imperative, but it's also not the right way to go for from a business perspective, right? Because you want your teams to operate as well as they can. And that means everybody should be able to work well together and not have, not feel like outsiders or, you know, be part of that. So anyway, um, yeah, some of the things we do would be to ask people to share times that they've experienced microaggressions or something like that. And, um, you know, one of the things is that when somebody experiences a microaggression, the feelings for them are real, even if the rest of like, if somebody experiences one and I'm standing there next to them, I might not feel it, right? It's like, oh, well, that was weird. But, you know, it really hurts the person who receives it. 
And, you know, people sometimes will get emotional sharing those stories like this happened to me. And, you know, it's and then it makes other people realize, wow, that is that is a real thing. That was not just some sort of, um, you know, issue with this person being overly sensitive or, you know, something like that. It's, I guess sometimes it's easy to dismiss people as just being too sensitive, like get over it or whatever. And when you hear them talk about it and hear why it affected them in that way, it kind of gives people a new appreciation for that, makes them more aware. Um, we also give people an opportunity to intervene as uh, allies. So two of the facilitators will kind of take turns insulting each other and the, the students have to intervene and you know, distract or use these various strategies to come in and, and be an ally rather than just being a bystander and, and doing nothing about it. Um, you know, when things are wrong, it's better to address them. And so that's kind of what we're helping our, our students learn. I guess it's like both in academia and also in the industry. So I can talk to you with a little bit about like what we have been doing as a company um, to drive that, especially after the, you know, the events of murder of George Floyd and like Black Lives Matter movement, we started having these courageous conversations with, we do have an employee network that focuses on um, black employees and, um, you know, creating the more inclusive, equitable environment for them. And they started the courageous conversations, which over I don't know how many of them that I actually did, but each of them would have over 500 people across the globe joining there. And then it would go for hours. And when you listen to real stories and like how they affected it, whether it is within the organization, professional organization in the company, or even just like walking down the street, then their problems become real. And like you start understanding and like you can basically create that empathy with them and then understand where they're coming from. But without that, having that platform for that courageous conversation, it is very difficult to understand their perspective or what they have been going through. Um, so I totally agree to that. The other part that from the very first answer that you gave it to talking about the women engineering program and how it is not only for women and um, you know, male students can participate it too. That will bring me to my next question. And because I really do believe that in order for us to achieve the gender equality, especially uh, in a profession like ours, which is more male dominated, it is very important to get that male allyship to really support women within the profession. Of course, diversity has many layers to it. And like what is visible to I, like it's just like talking about the race and gender is often like the much more talked about. And I try to highlight some other portions, but I think this is important to get your opinion on the gender issue. There was a discussion earlier in like one of the uh, professional organizations that I'm a member of that we were talking about how the data shows that uh, there are more and more female students enrolled in STEM and especially in engineering programs. And there sure is an increase in the representation of females, women, and the uh, industry as well. But the percentages when you look at it, like not quite ca catching up. So there is a significant percentage that is being lost after the graduation from the school. Um, so really, and if you, we start looking into the leadership portion if like that requires especially in our profession to stay within the industry for several years then the number of women unfortunately getting out of the industry significantly increases so um and then there are reports that are recently released by the leaning and mckinsey that is just like really proving that this is the case so what is in your opinion that needs to change and like what can be done like to really engage those students. I think one thing that you were talking about, like how to engage with them to show them role models in the early on is important, but what else we can do in the profession, whether it's in academia, like moving forward with that or in the industry to help change that? Yeah, well, I think one of the important things is that you're right that, you know, 
female representation in engineering is increasing for sure. Um, some engineering fields have reached parity in uh, the student body in those majors. Um, but of course, the so the the you know a student comes through in four years and earns a bachelor's degree. So it's a pretty rapid cycle. Um, a career is much longer, right? You're looking at thirty years or so. Um, so the makeup of our industry is a reflection not of who's coming to college now, but who has been going to college for thirty years since you know the seventies or eighties. And so, the, you know, the industry will naturally change more slowly um, just for that reason. Um, but, you know, you do mention that women still are leaving engineering at greater rates than men. And um, <clears throat> there's, you know, there there's a whole host of reasons that people have put forth for that. Um, some people say, well, you know, they when women start having families, they take time off and never fully, you know, re-engage in their in their job. Um, I understand that argument, but I think there are other factors that may be bigger. Um, you know, a lot of women cite the fact that their their career development opportunities just weren't there in the company, or there's something wrong with the climate it feels like a good old boys network or something like that and those are things that we can change right we can start to have mentorship programs i mean a lot of companies already do that this kind of work you mentioned that you know jacobs is having these conversations and things like that but uh just making sure that that people feel welcomed there and um again i'll just point out that this is not just like we want to make sure that everybody's happy, you know, like uh, rainbows and unicorns sort of thing. This is good for business. If everybody feels engaged and they're happy, it's better for your business to have that happen. So it is worth investing effort into figuring this out and learning how to recognize issues that may be coming up and figuring out how to, you know, address them so that women do feel welcome equal and that they have you know a strong future in the industry right right and it's i guess i'm just gonna ask you to uh give that this is gonna be the nerd in me but like it really resonated with me when you, you know what i'm talking about now scott like how the diversity and inclusion helps business because sometimes there is that conversation of just like it really is just like it, it might not be as clear for many to really see that and i really did love when we were talking about it how you explained it i what i probably reference it so many times when i'm talking with others but i would like you to share that with our audience as well sure so um one of the things that i've also done as associate dean is is workshops for faculty um, on inclusive teaching and um, when I started working with some of the um, social science folks at UCLA, uh, I told them that I wanted to show all of the faculty an equation that illustrates the benefit of diversity. And they were like, you're going to show an equation? I was like, yeah, yeah, trust me. They're engineers. You know, this is going to work. So, um, so the way it works is basically along the lines of uh, signal stacking, which is a method that's used in electrical engineering to reduce noise in, in noisy signals. Um, and so the idea is, you know, if you have um, a, a sample of people who are answering questions, say you have 100 people um, who are solving a problem and providing an answer, well, each person is not going to be perfect, right? There's going to be some kind of distribution function describing the error in their answer. So if we assume that like all 100 people have the same error distribution function, then we could start doing things like, you know, averaging the answers. Um, and so if you take if you take a sample or a group of people who are unbiased, so the mean in their answer error is zero, but it has a standard deviation, and all 100 are uncorrelated, right? Correlation among the people is actually a measure of 
diversity. So uncorrelated correlation coefficient of zero is like as diverse as you can get. They're all totally unrelated to each other. Um, the standard deviation of the error actually decreases with the square root of the number of people. So if you have 100 people, you get a tenth as much error if you average all 100. Uh, once you start introducing correlation, like um, let's say that the errors are perfectly correlated. That means everybody is over predicting or under predicting each time by the same amount. Each individual may be off by the same distribution function, but now everybody's doing it the same way. Then you don't get any improvement at all. Right, the error in the output distribution function is identical to the individual. So there is a benefit to be had from um, from this averaging, and that you know, averaging is a mathematical process, right? Averaging Gaussian functions is something that we can easily do and demonstrate mathematically. Uh, but what that means from a social perspective is that you're actually listening to everybody's opinions, right? Everyone brings a unique perspective. So when they're all bringing their unique perspectives and they all have, you know, a voice at the table, a seat at the table and a voice in the process. And we we come up with an end result that actually is a collaboration of many different perspectives and voices. The outcome is is better. And, you know, literature shows that companies are more profitable when they do focus on this and make sure that they're having some diversity of opinion among their employees. Thank you, Scott. I I always love this explanation, so I think it's brilliant. Um, so, you know, I've previously mentioned that I had the privilege of like working with you on the Geotechnical Architect Engineering and Soil Dynamics Technical Committee for the Geo Institute. So since we are talking about inclusion and diversity in the geotech, maybe we'll bring it to the organization that we are both part of. So as a chair of the technical committee, what do you see the maybe the biggest challenge or obstacle, if any, um, to achieving inclusion and truly inclusion and diversity in the organization itself or in the profession. So, but also, you know, when we talk about inclusion and diversity, maybe we can also think about like a, all different layers, not just gender or race. Yeah. So, actually, I think that the EESD committee is is pretty is a pretty diverse group. I mean, when we get together, you've got people from all over the world, uh, people of all races. You know, there's quite a few women represented. So maybe it's not 50-50, but um, I think that there's a significant percentage. So I don't know. I've, I've felt like that committee has been a really good example of, of diversity. And I'm not taking credit for that. That's not the result of something that I did. It was like that when I took over as chair <laughs> three years ago from um, Adrian Rodriguez Marek at Virginia Tech. So um, I, I'm, I'm I, not sure I think there, are is, some, but, yeah. there are some like great, great things that like both you and Adrian did. It's just like the, the reason why I mentioned that, like you know, maybe diversity beyond uh, gender and race, because I think and I'm talking with experience, you did also bring some uh, generational diversity and uh, maybe the leadership positions within that technical committee, so. Yeah, I mean, it is true that the younger members tend to reflect more diversity just because of the natural tendency for, you know, universities to become more diverse over time. And so we have brought in some younger members to take on leadership roles and I think that is an important thing. You know, oftentimes we view these leadership roles as being an honor that should be reserved for people who have had a long career. And um, I think that's perfectly fine. I think we need people who have a lot of experience to help guide our efforts. But there's room also for bringing in young people who bring a different perspective to the table and maybe are better even at, you know, certain outreach things and understand what's going on in universities, what, you know, if you've just graduated, you have a better handle on what things you wished you knew in from college to help you in your career and can help with with that sort of thing. Um, so that is true. We, we do have a fairly young, um, you know, board, which has been good. Yeah. And, but if there was one thing that you would, you had like a, um, 
you you have the silver bullet that you can fix or like to kind of improve one thing. Is there something, and that doesn't necessarily need to be just for the EST, but maybe for more like the Geo Institute or the geotechnical profession, what would be the one thing that is related to diversity and inclusion that you will try to tackle? Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, I think that one of the biggest issues we have is that no students enter a university thinking that they're going to do geotechnical engineering, right? <laughs> I don't know if this is so much a diversity and inclusion thing as we usually think of it in terms of you know race and gender and personal identity characteristics, but having an identity as a geotechnical engineer is part of inclusion, right? So it's really common. Students will come into my class and, well, I, I, I didn't go to school thinking I'm going to be a geotechnical engineer. I didn't even know what that was, right? Oh, hold on just a second. My dog's chewing on a cord. Oh, is she or he going to make an appearance? <laughs> yeah, she's right here. She was just chewing on an electrical cord. So this is oh, pain. So <laughs> she's four months old now and is uh, kind of a handful full of energy. <laughs> um, so yeah, I was saying, you know, when I entered civil engineering, I was going to be a structural engineer, wanted to build bridges and things like that. Had never heard of geotech. And um, of course, then I took my first geotech class and loved it. There was so much um, judgment there. I really liked working, you know, with materials that are not made by people and carefully controlled in a laboratory, figuring out the properties of the soil at the site was really interesting. It's like a puzzle. You have to put all these pieces together to form the picture. And so I really liked that. Um, and then decided to go that route and went to graduate school. So uh, I don't, I, I think the silver bullet for the Geo Institute, I think would be to put geotech on the map as a viable career path for people before they even get to college, because we're kind of fighting an uphill battle trying to convince students that geotech is a good way to go. <laughs> yeah. And, that, and that, that also brings the diversity because like, you know, it is only the group of people that are graduating that is coming to the industry or the academia that's forming the next generation of the work um, workforce that we're looking into increasing the diversity. So like the outreach is an important point of it. Yeah. Um, and I think it's not always clear how the work that we do benefits yeah. people. You know, it's, so I think that a lot of people are drawn to engineering because they like solving equations and want to do finite element models and things like that. Um, but that's only one part of it, right? If we want a more diverse group of people coming into our profession, we need to tell the story of how what we do is really benefiting society. How is this helping people? And uh, I think that would be a great um, goal for the Geo Institute EESD committee. Um, I have to admit, I've been so busy, I haven't been able to do a whole lot as EESD chair this year, especially with COVID, but as kind of aspirational goals, I think that that would be a huge improvement that would keep our profession healthy and strong. So um, I will ask like the next question about the cultural inclusion and diversity. It's something that became more and more prominent as I work in a global company and um, the my role becomes like in a more global structure. So it is you, whether it is with my clients, whether it is with my colleagues, you are interacting with all these people that are coming from the back, different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And it is very, really important that I've learned over the past year as a part of my position with uh, the One World Employee Network, but also with the different positions that really understanding like how these different ethnic backgrounds affect the way that we interact with each other and you know creating that cultural intelligence as they call it now in addition to emotional intelligence and such uh forming that is really important and i was thinking about it like when you think about the university especially within the united states definitely that was not the case in turkey there was diversity but not necessarily significantly cultural um there are like basically hubs of these cultural diversity right and like where that inclusion can get into place and like somebody can really start forming that you know cultural intelligence becoming a global citizen as we call it um like 
I'm just curious, like while we are like ed being educated in this like very significantly culturally diverse locations, like how what is it needed to really take that multicultural experience and understanding of that cultural inclusion to the workplaces and organizations? So like where do you think that misconnect is happening? Yeah, well, I, I think what you're raising is a really important issue. I mean, you know, until transportation allowed people really to move freely around the world, there was almost no cultural diversity. People would grow up in the same little town or village and, and that was it. So this issue of people having to interact across differences is actually a pretty new thing in terms of certainly human history, for sure. Even within the last hundred years, you know, it's a totally new thing. So um, I think first we should just recognize that things are probably not going to go smoothly, right? We have these differences in the way that we were raised, the values that we share, those are all very much culturally motivated. So I, you know, first just understanding that things may be, it may be difficult for us to communicate with each other across some of these differences is an important first step. Um, I think also, you know, there's obviously there's a tendency to, to really be interested in other people's ethnicity and their cultural background to kind of learn more about them and what they do. And I think people shy away from asking questions sometimes because they, they don't want to be perceived as um, being biased in some way against a particular culture. So, you know, the common thing is like, you might ask somebody, where are you from? Right. Somebody comes to the United States from another country, they have an accent, you know, it's it's clear that they were not born in the United States and raised here. And you ask, where are you from? Well, that can actually be perceived pretty negatively because the person saying like, you're not American where, you know, what you're not from around here. What are you doing here? And in reality, you're just trying to show interest in their ethnic background. Right. So it, it's a sensitive thing, too. And it's hard to have these conversations sometimes. I mean, I'm, I'm sure people have asked you this, right? Where are you from? <laughs> An I, the answer is saying from Texas. From Texas. <laughs> <laughs> um, then, then they ask me, so no, where are you are really from? And it's I, I yeah. usually tease people. So because you're actually very right. I do have friends who would get offended because they've been living in the States for so long or the majority of their lives. And when they're asked about it, um, it, it just like they they take they get offensive about that. I just joke around it. Yeah. Well, I mean, people do have different reactions to these things for sure. But I, I would say try and view, you know, I try and view it from the perspective of what if I moved to another country and had to learn all this new set of cultural norms and how to get along there. You know, anytime I travel internationally, I really do feel that feeling of like, wow, I don't, this is different. You know, I don't belong here. It makes me feel uncomfortable. Um, I think over time it would probably become much more comfortable, but then to constantly be reminded like, wow, you're really different. You know, that, that would be a little bit strange. So I don't know, finding a way to interact and engage with each other in a way that's respectful, where you really are saying like, you know, I'm really interested to learn more about your background. What was it like? you know, growing up where you did or, you know, those kind of things, I think are always good questions to ask. And I think it is really important as you get into those interactions to understand what is really cultural, what is personal and like what is like the that person's reaction to that situation, situational is like to be able to understand it. It's like really your level of cultural intelligence and like you only can do that when you seriously, genuinely interested in understanding the other person. I gave some of the examples. But going back to the um, asking me where I'm from, I made peace with it, Scott. I'm never going to be able to pronounce the TH sound or the difference between these and the W's. Not happening. So like that's the way I answer that question also. <laughs> and like whenever I'm giving a talk or so, I usually start saying this. So like in case people get confused. Anyway. Right. <laughs> um. And you raise a really good point too, Menzer, that, you know, the cultural norms from the, the society where somebody was raised don't define them either, right? Everybody's their own individual. And, you know, seeing people that way, I think is really an important thing. And, you know, it's, that's like a really common sense, almost like self-evident thing to say, 
but it's not as easy to do as it sometimes seems, right? Um, it's hard to separate an individual from their cultural context and their ethnicity and other things, uh, but that's what we should strive for. It for sure requires a conscious effort from the receiver's side to really try to empathize, empathize and understand that. I have one, one last question. I know we're coming uh, to the end of our time, but we've talked about this one as well. Uh, and that is about, you know, with like this inclusion and diversity getting more and more um, widespread ideas to talk about. There is a significant amount of inclusion and diversity training that is happening in the universities and the organizations and such. And you mentioned that in earlier the uh, in our conversation as well, some people who are not necessarily interested in this idea or not did not buy into it. Let's say, I don't. We talk about. It. I don't think those people are being able to be turned around or like really understand it by that training because what they see it as like just like okay, this is this additional corporate thing that I need to go through or this training that I need to go through and it does not really get that buy in. And um, you mentioned pre when we were talking previously some of the studies that are around it. Um, can you share your thoughts and maybe some insights? Yeah, sure. I think I was talking to you about a, an article that was in the Harvard Business Review that was um, sent to me by a colleague who's a behavioral scientist at UCLA. And um, what she was doing, well, what that article does is points out First, that diversity training in the United States is an $8, eight billion dollar a year industry. So it's a big deal. It's a lot of money in it. And a lot of the training is pretty ineffective at changing anybody's behaviors. So, you know, going through something that talks about implicit bias might make people aware of implicit bias as an issue, but does it really have an impact on, on their behavior? And the evidence seems to be that no, it really doesn't. Um, that you know, it might make them aware of some of the concepts, and you know, just as like an information exchange, the trainings can work well. But things that were proven to work are more personal. You know, it's mentorship, making sure that you have somebody who you know really has taken a vested interest in your career and can help you out. Um, you know, it, it's things like that 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 really do help. And then, yeah, the, there was another part of the article too, which is that um, when people are coming from a perspective that is opposed to the idea of diversity and inclusion, and they're forced to go through a training, it, it actually can sometimes make their behavior worse. So right. it just it, it, they get more ingrained in their position that is that this is a bunch of nonsense, mm -hmm. and so that is a a difficult thing to, to deal with, right? Like, um, how do you reach out to everybody? Because from a diversity and inclusion spec perspective, that should be the goal. You should be able to reach out to everybody and include everyone. And so how do you do it when people are kind of dug in? Well, um, you know, I, we all have to go through all these trainings, right? It's like another thing that I have to do to check the box and make sure that I've done my, you know, my thing. and. If, if it gets to be that sort of thing and, and somebody has to go through it, you know, they're not going to take to it all that well. And so more substantive changes, you know, mentorship, providing counter stereotypical examples of, you know, people who, you know, achieve in a way that is not what you would necessarily expect based on some aspect of their identity can help change people's minds. Um, and I completely agree with that because I've seen it over and over again. It's just like when you do those diversity and inclusion trainings or the classes or the courses or like, you know, events or activities, the people who will be get who will be interested in participating and who get excited about it are already the people who are really um, understanding the value that it brings and like the real champions but like really getting to the people who are not necessarily a big fan of it or like really understanding the value that it brings is that the challenge we do have one question from the audience i know i told you the last question but like there's one more question and i actually want to ask this one um in what ways do you consider diversity when evaluating graduate school applicants especially if the pool is not very diverse 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in in California, state law prohibits us from using identity characteristics as part of admissions. So um, we don't look at a person's race or gender as part of the admission process. Um, we do value contributions that students have made to diversity. So if they've been involved in pipeline programs through societies like um, the National Society of Black Engineers or the Society for Hispanic Professional Engineers or Society of Women Engineers, things like that. Uh, that can be a part of their accomplishment. That's, that's not their identity. That's something they've done, not something that they are. And so um, there are, you know, statements of personal statements and uh, statements of contributions to diversity. I, that's not exactly the right word for it for grad students, but something like that. But uh, yeah, as a public institution in California, we we don't look at, at identity characteristics as part of admission. Thanks for sharing that, Scott. And that wraps up our very last live stream of 2020. So thank you once again for agreeing to be my guest and happy birthday and happy Thanks. New Year's and happy holidays, Scott. It was, it was a pleasure having you here and thank you for sharing your insights about diversity and inclusion with us. So um, for the audience, this is our final, as I mentioned, live stream of 2020, which means the end of the year is near within 15 days. There is a reminder that I would like to make. GI past president Ed Kavazinjian generously donated 125,000 as a matching gift to GI student programs, that's GI Institute student programs. That means any contribution you make up to that 125,000 will be matched by Ed this year, the GI's 25th anniversary. The student programs are really, really important in bringing up that diverse pool of next generation leaders in the geotechnical engineering profession and fostering inclusion and diversity in our workplaces. I personally benefited from them when I was a graduate student and so are many of the young professionals that we grew up together in our industry that are that were in the same generation with me and who are now on their way of becoming leaders in academia and in the industry. So please consider donating for the GI student programs. We have some great 25th year anniversary uh, thank you gifts for you. And if you start your donation at the geoinstitute.org, you can just click on the student participation fund. And to those who have already contributed, we thank you very much. And with that, we are I'm ready to close the last live stream of 2020. We will we are looking forward to seeing you in the next year. We'll coming back with six new um, live streams for 2021 that is will be focused around inclusion and diversity. Happy holidays and happy new year, everybody.